This conference will now be recorded. Hello, good morning to everybody. Um, it is now 1 p.m. Paris time, so we will get started on this webinar. Uh, my name is Catalina Echeverry. I'm with the CCAC Secretariat and a coordinator to the Agriculture Initiative. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on bioenergy, biogas policies and practices in India and Denmark, where we have uh, four special invitees that will be presenting today. Um, this is a topic of interest to the CCAC Agriculture Initiative. As we have started uh, initially, when we began the initiative, we started to work on, uh, on biogas, uh, capturing methane as a source of energy, um, on our work around manure management. And now we've started uh, to extend our work in, an, uh, in a more integrated approach, focusing on sustainable bioenergy, uh, working now with FAO. Um, in Punjab, India, uh, where we have, where we are looking at ways uh, for using, for alternative use of crop residues for energy. So this is this is very exciting for us, and I'm very pleased to see that uh, many have joined today's webinar, and I see that others are sh are shortly joining. Um, so I would like to get started with our first presenter. Uh, his name is Vijay Bharti. He is working with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in India as a scientist in the field of waste to energy. Uh, he has been there since 2016 and previously worked with various private sector companies in, solar en in the solar energy sector, uh, mainly on solar PV project energy and en engineering, I'm sorry. So without uh, further delay, uh, Vijay, thank you very much for joining. Please. Yeah, thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, as introduced by uh, Katilna, I'm, uh, I'm working here as scientist B in the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy uh, in the sector, uh, waste to sector. And uh, so th today I will be presenting about India's uh, program and incentive uh, being implemented in the biogas uh, sector. So uh, I will start my presentation and uh, I will start presentation with the Indian power sector, brief about uh, the sector. So India's uh, power sector started uh, its journey in uh, 1897, where the first commercial uh, power plant uh, was installed, uh, you know, that was the hydro power. And uh, since then uh, we have, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, um, policies, schemes, acts uh, were introduced from time to time to promote this uh, sector. Uh, the predominant uh, uh, acts were uh, uh, before uh, uh, independence, uh, that uh, 1903 Indian Electricity Act, and after uh, uh, in 14, 1948, the Electricity Supply Act was there. Uh, which uh, I mean uh, boosted uh, power sector uh, in big way. Then latest one, uh, Electricity Act 2003, which uh, uh, was uh, you know consolidated consolidated uh, uh, act, uh, 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 promoted uh, a lot of uh, new in the sector. And uh, through all these uh, acts, uh, India was able to reach uh, 360 gigawatt uh, capacity uh, in the country. Uh, so, the, uh, out of 360 major event today, uh, major components come from the uh, coal, uh, gas. Uh, renewable contribution uh, in the country as on today is 80 gigawatt, that is around 22 uh, percent. Of total capacity installed. So, out of uh, in if you talk about uh, renewable energy, uh, India has set a huge target uh, uh, to install uh, uh, renewable capacity 175 gigawatt by 2022. 20, uh, so, out of uh, uh, 175, 100 gigawatt is will come from solar, 60 from wind, 10 from uh, uh, bio, and 5 from uh, hydro. So, if we see uh, this achievement, uh, uh, particularly bioenergy has already reached its uh, targeted achievement 
uh, it, it is very close to achieving actually 9.9 gigawatt we have already achieved and uh, it's I'm, I'm not uh, giving uh, you know the uh, break up here in the presentation but uh, out of 9.9 .9, major component is coming from biomass uh, plants for power uh, and other uh, contribution uh, comes from waste energy like uh, biogas based power uh, plants incineration based uh, from uh, other waste so <laughs> we have i mean uh, good uh, progress we have made good progress in um, uh, bioenergy so uh, coming to bioenergy uh, traditionally uh, bioenergy uh, mostly was uh, actually bioenergy is the most uh, uh, the oldest uh, form of uh, renewable energy uh, we used to uh, use in the form of heat uh, uh, we uh, were generated from various kind of uh, biomass. Now, with the advent of uh, latest technology, we are able to achieve uh, uh, different kind of product like biogas, bio CNG, biofuel, and even uh, we are making pellets and briquettes also that can be used uh, uh, in different plants. So, you know. Uh, out of uh, the bioenergy, um, uh, here a point of interest is biogas. And uh, actually, biogas has a huge potential. Uh, it can be uh, recently in India, uh, uh, bio CNG has been hot topic. So, uh, another uh, point is uh, municipal solid waste. That is a huge problem across the world. And if uh, segregated, uh, um, uh, it, it, biomass can be segregated into uh, biodegradable component. It has huge potential in uh, uh, converting to biogas. And uh, another challenge is uh, uh, blending of uh, 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 new biofuels into conventional fuels. That in under uh, that policy is under formulation, and we will uh, uh, softly see bio CNG and other form of biofuels will be blended uh, with the uh, good target so uh, to achieve this uh, huge uh, uh, potential available in the country and uh, target set by government of india uh, there are various uh, biogas programs were launched uh, from time to time so and uh, these uh, uh, some of the biogas programs are uh, uh, only for the biogas component and other uh, were uh, covering other uh, aspects of the uh, renewable energy. Uh, so first of all, so biogas for waste energy program is there that uh, covers all type of uh, organic waste. And uh, then biogas is, uh, scheme is uh, covering only rural areas, Satat program is there. So I will be, um, in the next slides, I will be uh, covering each of uh, separately. So, uh, first one is the biogas uh, energy, uh, waste energy is program. So, basically, this program is, is um, uh, for recovery of energy in the form of biogas, uh, bio CNG, power, syngas from all type of uh, renewable waste. So, uh, this schemes cover uh, all type of waste to all type of uh, generation uh, and basically uh, in this scheme only uh, bigger plants are covered. I see uh, plants, biogas plants uh, which are uh, more than 2500 cubic meter per day and for power generation based on biogas uh, 250 kilowatt. And this uh, scheme uh, also covers uh, MSW to energy also. And uh, <clears throat> the potential uh, for uh, basically urban and industrial organic waste was estimated in India that is close to uh, 5700 megawatt equivalent. And uh, that's a huge uh, potential. Uh, agriculture waste is not uh, estimated uh, as of now. Uh, but uh, if you see, uh, uh, mostly uh, under this scheme, uh, industrial uh, sector has uh, uh, more successful than other sectors. If you see the achievement here, 
uh, our, right now we have achieved 330 uh, megawatt uh, of uh, installation in the country. So out of 330 industry, uh, waste energy projects have been installed in industries. That is uh, around 65%. And uh, urban uh, and including MSW uh, has capacity around 34 percent. Agricultural waste like paddy straw and uh, cotton straw has seen very uh, limited uh, success here. So I mean that's why we focused on uh, estimating potential from urban and industrial uh, organic waste. So under uh, this scheme. Uh, back ended capital subsidy is provided for uh, waste energy plants, and the pattern is uh, given here. Uh, uh, for biogas generation plants, uh, for 1 megawatt size, uh, capital subsidy uh, comes around uh, 140,000 USD. That is around uh, 20 to 30 percent of project cost. Similar. Uh, if uh, the biogas is upgraded to bio CNG, uh, the subsidy pattern uh, will uh, uh, drastically change to 563,000 USD. That is uh, for production of 1400 kgs per day uh, bio CNG. If the same biogas is uh, converted into power, the subsidy pattern will change to 422,000. USD per megawatt. So this is a brief, I mean, uh, financial support uh, basically for the biogas and uh, other streams of the biogas uh, that is close to 20 to 30 percent of project cost is supported by uh, government of India. Apart from this financial support in the form of uh, capital subsidy, uh, there are a lot of incentives available for waste to energy projects. Uh, one is it is given a must and status. Uh, so the discounts as to compulsory uh, procure all the uh, powers produced from the waste to energy plants. Other initiative claims recently uh, in the uh, motor vehicle rules, uh, uh, BioCNG was allowed to use in uh, uh, motor vehicles. So this was a big boost for uh, biogas uh, plants. Uh, so uh, now uh, uh, recently we will, uh, in coming um, slides you'll see there is a separate scheme for BioCNG uh, plants. Another in terms of uh, GST and taxes, uh, all these waste energy plants are kept in 5% GST and uh, the concessional custom duty is also uh, uh, given to uh, equipment which are reported from uh, uh, other countries and uh, that uh, concession is uh, given for 5 percent. So uh, so this is I mean uh, a very uh, brief about uh, waste energy scheme. So typically the government of India provides 20 to 30 percent of uh, capital subsidy for uh, waste energy plants. So there is a uh, now this waste energy schemes covers all uh, you know the broad is a broad broader scheme. So uh, the, another uh, uh, scheme of government of India is a biogas uh, scheme. So this scheme is uh, dedicated to uh, rural areas only and uh, for smaller uh, plants. You see, uh, there are uh, two service schemes under this program. Uh, one is for uh, 1 to 25 cubic meter per day. Another is uh, 30 to 3500 cubic meter per day by this plant capacity. The target and uh, other things are uh, uh, same here. I mean, this target uh, is uh, waste to produce in rural areas, and uh, this uh, scheme uh, is aimed to provide uh, clean cooking uh, fuel for uh, rural areas where, I mean, uh, uh, mostly in rural areas, people uh, use biomass uh, for uh, cooking. So that is uh, uh, not eco-friendly practice. So to reduce that uh, problem, the biogas programs were launched, and uh, this has seen a pretty good uh, uh, success uh, all over the world. India is, uh, I think, second topmost uh, country in terms of biogas installation, and uh, 
the, the potential was estimated around 1 to 12 million biogas plant uh, of capacity 1 to 25 cubic meter and uh, out of 12 5 million plants have been installed apart from uh, uh, smaller plants uh, uh, the, the, in other service scheme uh, 20 30 to 25 cubic cubic meter per day capacity plant power generation we have achieved around 8.7 megawatt and biogas generation we have achieved around 86000 cubic meter per day so in this under this scheme also uh, government of india provides back ended capital subsidy to promote uh, biogas uh, installation in the country the pattern is like uh, this under uh, one scheme uh, uh, support is provided uh, per plant basis and other under uh, other scheme support is provided per kilowatt basis so a uh, pattern you can see uh, uh, it's uh, again uh, in uh, uh, one number if you give uh, is uh, around 20 30 to 35 percent of capital uh, cost is covered by government of india there is a provision of uh, uh, additional subsidy if biogas plants are linked with the toilet and uh, enhanced subsidy is also provided by, for uh, backward states and uh, backward community of the country. So this scheme, I mean, uh, this is the oldest one uh, scheme and uh, as of now, this has seen uh, good uh, success. So, but uh, there were few, I mean, uh, other uh, So, um, uh, coming uh, to next uh, uh, policy, um, these, these uh, the first two schemes were very uh, old one and uh, had served very well. Now, they were uh, need of another policies and schemes which were not covered under these two schemes. So, uh, last year, uh, Government of India launched a national policy of biofuels. The main target of this policy was to cut import of uh, uh, fossil fuel and uh, utilize domestic feedstock and uh, surplus food of quantity to generate biofuels. So, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, program, basically, uh, the target was set uh, for blending of biofuels into conventional fuel. And the target is like 20% uh, of uh, ethanol in petrol and 5% of biodiesel by 2030. So as of now, uh, if you see current situation, the uh, achievement in uh, biodiesel, uh, blending of uh, biodiesel in diesel is uh, not much uh, satisfactory. It is less than 1%. But uh, blending of ethanol in petrol, uh, we are seeing a, a, a upward trajectory year by year. And uh, um, to, uh, to achieve this target, uh, India, under this policy, various uh, sub schemes or uh, programs will be launched. So, uh, one of uh, to increase ethanol's blending in uh, uh, petrol, there is a separate ethanol blending petrol program for biodiesel, biodiesel blending program is there. And uh, this policy also focuses on advanced biofuel. Advanced biofuel mainly include uh, uh, 2G ethanol and uh, bio CNG, biomethanol uh, and 3G uh, biofuels based on algae. So you see the uh, out of uh, uh, various type of biofuel, there is a one important uh, biofuel is there, bio CNG. So we are focusing on that part, only bio CNG parts. So for uh, to increase the blending of bio CNG uh, in the country, they uh, last year again there was a scheme launched uh, uh, that is called sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation. In short, SATA. So this uh, scheme particularly deals with bio CNG generation of bio CNG uh, in the country. So what is this scheme about? So uh, this scheme is uh, part of uh, biofuel policy launched in 2018 last year in October month. So <coughs> basically 
uh, under this uh, scheme, um, potential of bioCNG was estimated around 62 million metric tons uh, per annum. So that's huge uh, the potential. And accordingly, target was set uh, to achieve uh, 15 metric million uh, million metric tons of CBG by 2023 through 5,000 CBG plants. So it is not like that CBG was not supported before uh, Satat scheme. The CBG was covered under waste energy plant, but uh, condition of uh, CBG was not uh, good. In terms of there was a lot of problems. First thing, I mean, there was no offtake guarantee from the government. And, I mean, the CBG generated from the plant has to be sold to uh, private uh, companies, restaurant, uh, food chain like this. There was a huge supply chain issue. Uh, there was no uh, fixed buyer at, available in the country. And there was no fixed price also. So to handle all these issues, last year the scheme was launched to uh, guarantee production of tech. So in this scheme, uh, the public sector oil marketing company will uh, enter into agreement and that uh, will buy uh, those companies will buy bio CNG at fixed rate. So this this uh, gave a huge boost in the sector, and uh, the the, the uh, proposals were invited from uh, uh, private sector. And uh, as of now, we have uh, achieved close to 350 uh, uh, proposals for setting up CBG plants. So. <laughs> Under this scheme, government will buy uh, CBG produced from uh, uh, the virus plants uh, at, the, at the rate of 0.29 uh, dollars per pound, and uh, there will be GST applicable on that. And uh, after uh, uh, including GST, the total amount will be 30.31 uh, per pound. So uh, that's uh, I mean this uh, has given this scheme has given a huge uh, opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs and uh, uh, biogas sector. Uh, earlier the condition uh, you see I mean uh, there were uh, only 16 uh, CBG plants were installed in the country that were generating uh, around 0.02 metric uh, million metric tons per year, and we have set a target of 15 million metric tons by 2023. So. There's a huge opportunity in there in the sector. So um, next uh, program uh, launched by Government of India is uh, galvanizing organic bio agri resources uh, program. That uh, this program is again a targeted program and uh, linked with the Clean India uh, Movement mission. Uh, this this scheme is all about uh, uh, managing uh, waste produced in rural areas and generating biogas uh, from that and uh, to uh, um, clean villages. That is the objective of uh, Clean India Mission. And uh, under this scheme, uh, target was set uh, uh, for save, setting of 700 biogas plants. Uh, by uh, the last uh, financial year and uh, as of now we have achieved around 318 biogas plants. So uh, the, here I mean uh, uh, the difference between uh, biogas, this program and biogas program uh, is that basically both programs are targeted program and these uh, uh, program are based on rural bio waste but only uh, the difference is uh, the, under that biogas program, uh, program anyone can uh, set up uh, uh, biogas plants any family or any individual can set up the biogas plant but here uh, this is uh, uh, the, the role of uh, uh, gram panchayat or community uh, or district or state uh, are the key stakeholders here so uh, based upon number of uh, so one uh, plant per project is assigned under this program and uh, financial support in the form of back-ended subsidy is provided just like other scheme 
and that will be it is like this uh, there are four models basically so from uh, uh, up to 100 percent of biogas plant is supported uh, under this program uh, if there is a entrepreneur involved and in, uh, and uh, he, he wants to they want to produce bio cng uh, then there is no support otherwise uh, in three models there is a support from 50 to 100 percent of bio plants so uh, this uh, this is uh, basically uh, scheme is for uh, meeting objective of um, the clean india uh, mission and, uh, and this scheme is under process and we hope i mean this scheme uh, will uh, achieve this uh, target. And so basically, uh, we have covered all the schemes. So, uh, yeah. So uh, th these are the five basic, uh, five main uh, biogas program uh, launched by uh, government of India. And uh, these, uh, I hope, I mean. Uh, this program uh, will achieve its uh, target. So uh, that's it from my end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vijay, uh, for presenting on India's programs and incentives being implemented to support biogas systems. Um, and and to the participants, please feel free to um, to note your questions in the comment box uh, that we can take after the call that we can take at the end of the call, I'm sorry. Um, now I would like to introduce you to Nick Elger. Uh, Nicholas Elger is the program manager for the US EPA AgStar program, and he serves as the agriculture lead and biogas subcommittee co-chair with the Global Methane Initiative. Um, in his role as program manager for AgStar, Nick works with the US livestock mm -hmm. industry state and federal agencies and biogas industry stakeholders to advance the deployment of digesters and biogas system. He's also um, helping advance anaerobic digestion of or organic feedstocks globally for methane mitigation and energy production. So I would like to now share uh, Nick Elger's presentation. He will be presenting. So welcome, welcome Nicholas. Thank you. All right. Are you able to see my screen yet? Yes. Yes, thank you. Is the GoToMeeting box up or is it just this presentation? The so presentation sure. is up. The okay, presentation great. The presentation is on the full screen, so it looks great. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Catalina. It's really Great to be here, part of the webinar today, and to work along the CCAC Ag Initiative. And I also want to thank Vijay Bharti and his colleagues in India and at MNRE for their work supporting biogas in India. Uh, that was a really great presentation, Vijay, to share all the great work that's that's happening in India. And I'm really appreciative for Vijay's collaboration and enthusiasm for working with the Global Methane Initiative and the US EPA on this yeah, thank you, thank you, Chris. So uh, I'm going to give a presentation on some of our collaboration with both the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and many other groups in India to help support uh, India's biogas programs and to share best practices from the US uh, EPA and our other programs in the US that are focused on biogas. Trying to advance the slide. There we go. So I'm going to provide a quick overview of the Global Methane Initiative. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just get into some of the details of US EPA and Global Methane, Global Methane Initiative's activities and collaboration in India. And then dive into some of the tools and resources that we've helped to develop uh, for Indian context, but also have context for uh, globally and then uh, discuss some upcoming activities and events for the Global Methane Initiative. So the Global Me Methane Initiative is an international public-private partnership focused on reducing methane emissions in five key sectors, oil and gas systems, 
coal mine, municipal solid waste, agriculture, primarily manure management, um, and agricultural feedstocks, and as well as wastewater. And we were formed in 2004 and have 45 countries that are partners of the Global Methane Initiative and over 500 project network members. And we collaborate really closely with the CCAC, uh, the UN ECE, and, and many other international organizations trying to help uh, share best practices to reduce methane emissions. And India and the United States are founding members of the Global Methane Initiative. Here's a, a map uh, just demonstrating all of the countries that are partners of the Global Methane Initiative, uh, making up 75% of the world's man-made methane emissions globally. And GMI, short for Global Methane Initiative, supports countries to help address a number of barriers um, and to help overcome those barriers. Um, so some of those are information barriers, technology, financial, policy, and communication and capacity barriers. And GMI helps to develop tools and resources for countries, help uh, develop resource assessments, provide trainings uh, and workshops, and share best practices um, and help exchange ideas from country to country on best ways to mitigate and to mitigate methane and to capture and use it beneficially. Um, and also providing technical assistance to help overcome many of these barriers. And so we've been working with India since uh, India joined the Global Methane Initiative in 2004. And um, as of recently, I joined the Global Methane Initiative uh, a little over three years ago, and I've been engaging uh, quite a bit. And that's some of the work that I'm going to discuss today on the agriculture side of uh, our work with India. So we've been working with a diverse group of stakeholders in India from the national and subnational level, as well as with nonprofits and private industry, uh, and have been trying to get an understanding of, you know, what uh, some of the challenges are in India and to advance biogas projects and methane capture. And so we've had a number of stakeholder meetings and have visited and, and met with a number of private developers and uh, uh, national and subnational government, government uh, agencies um, and have held a series of workshops um, to help identify some of the barriers and share information and best practices for overcoming those barriers. And through these activities, um, identified a number of tools that could be developed to help support India's goals of, um, of to help support the incentives and their goals for supporting the biogas industry that uh, VJ laid out in his previous presentation. And so three of the, the tools that I, I'm gonna discuss today are one, a risk analysis and technical review guidance and checklist for biogas projects, an anaerobic digester project screening tool, and a an, uh, national anaerobic digester project database. So the risk analysis and technical review guidance and checklist is a tool uh, meant to really meant to help reduce the risk or the perceived risk of, of projects, of biogas projects. And when I say biogas projects, um, I'm referring to large scale anaerobic digester systems as shown in this picture here. And these large scale biogas projects can be technically complicated and are really challenging for lenders to understand all of the risks that are involved with funding projects. Um, there's a lot of technical um, complexity as well as the business model. And so there's a lot of different moving parts when these biogas projects are set up. And so what we aim to do, well, Methane Initiative was to help share best practices from the U.S. and to help reduce the, the risk of lending to these projects by creating a best practices checklist that projects should meet in order to receive funding. So um, as VJ uh, explained, many, there are many initiatives in India from the government that are providing financial incentives, as well as there are a number of 
uh, private lending institutions that are providing loans to projects. And what we tried to do was bring some of the best practices from both the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, where we review uh, proposals for projects that are seeking um, either grants or loans and, and share those with um, our partners in India. And what we hope this can help do is to help improve uh, the ability for lenders to review the best practices for projects, um, but as well as to help educate uh, project developers for these are the best practices for both technical, technically with the biogas system, but also the business model that um, uh, can help have a success, help them have a successful project. And there are a number of, this is just a, a listing of some of the, the overall best practices broken up into several categories. The picture on the right there is a, uh, it's pretty small, but it's the, it's a, a sample of the checklist. Um, but essentially we go through, I think close to 40 different best practices for project development from the feedstock supply and characteristics, the biogas production and biogas use, some of the facilities and the equipment, the financial side of things, looking at the permitting and operations and um, just the overall uh, financial feasibility, financial and technical feasibility of projects. So we're really excited to work with our partners in India to help share these best practices so that when lenders provide funding to projects, uh, they can have some hopefully have some assurance that these projects are meeting these best practices and so that these biogas projects are successful in the long run. The second tool that we have, the Global Methane Initiative um, has helped develop, um, not only for India, but for all countries. And I, I should note that these, all of these tools that we developed um, are both for India, but as well as can be adapted for other countries as well too. So the, Anaerobic Digester Project Screening Tool is a Microsoft Excel-based screening, screening tool to help estimate biogas production and greenhouse gases and associated greenhouse gases that can be admitted, or excuse me, reduced from setting up a biogas system. So um, it's, I would say it's a, a little bit more, it's between a back of the envelope estim, estimation of biogas production and a full-scale feasibility study. So it's meant to provide a little bit more granular detail um, by using a pretty simple tool to um, help get an estimate of biogas production. And what the tool does is um, you'll enter in different uh, information about the type of technology and the feedstock, and, and it can help evaluators, both on the government or the lending institution, help review applications for projects um, to say, you know, when an application comes in and the, the project developer says it's gonna produce X amount of biogas, um, this tool can be used to help verify that that gas uh, will be produced. And it's not as, it's not as detailed as a, you know, a full out uh, feasibility study, but it, it provides a, a pretty accurate um, estimation of biogas production. Um, and then on the flip side, it can also be used by project developers or city officials that are interested in installing biogas plants that have an idea of, you know, we may have, like, for example, um, a community may say, yeah, we have 500 uh, dairy cows and there's a food production facility that has some food waste that we may be able, might be able to utilize. We can enter that information into the project screening tool to get an estimation of how much biogas could be produced, um, and then that can be you know, translated into uh, an economic study, a brief economic study for the project. This is uh, an example uh, of some of the inputs from the tool. So some of the inputs would include information about the general information about the size of the digester and the type of digester that would be anticipated being built. Um, and then information about the feedstocks. 
And there are some other inputs, but these are just a couple examples. Um, and there's, there's, it's pretty, it's fairly easy, user friendly to use. You can, there's a lot of pre um, uh, and pre information uploaded into the tool already, and a lot of calculations on the background that help estimate the biogas production. And so what comes out is uh, basically an estimation of what the project could achieve, um, both on the biogas side of things, methane production, how much digestate or an India uh, manure on the back end can be uh, produced, and as well as the emission reductions. And there's a number of different outputs that come out, can come out of it. You can see at the bottom there from the various feedstocks, there's an estimation of how much biogas and methane can be produced from uh, those feedstocks. And one of the last tools that we have been uh, working with India and particular uh, VJ Bharti and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy on is a national level database for medium and large scale anaerobic digester projects. The program that I work for in, in the U.S. is the U.S. EPA AgStar program, and we uh, have a national database for our, our anaerobic digester projects in the U.S., and it's really one of the most valuable tools we have for understanding where the market stands in the U.S. for anaerobic digesters, as well as helping to educate uh, the industry on where the market stands and also being able to quantify the economic and environmental benefits of projects. And so what we're um, helping to do right now in India is to help gather information on existing projects, existing large-scale biogas projects in India, and as well as helping uh, to establish a, a, a protocol and a system for tracking these new projects that will be coming online in India. As Vijay Bharti had noted in his previous presentation, India has really big plans for expanding their biogas industry in India um, with an est estimating with more than 5,000 large scale biogas projects will be constructed. And so we're really um, excited to help uh, establish a tracking system for these projects um, to help them help the both MNR, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, be able to estimate the environmental and economic benefits of these projects, but as well as to share that information with the industry uh, to have, uh, so that there's a thorough understanding of where the market stands and what some of the best practices are for understanding projects. And it can also be helpful for, for private lenders to understand where the market stands as well too for when uh, new projects are seeking uh, financial assistance. Some of the fields that are in the database, that will be in the database are name and location of the project, what the operational status is, is it open, is it closed, is there a reason that why it closed, um, the type of digester and the baseline waste management system, what types of feedstocks are being used in the system? How is the energy being used? Is it being used to produce bio CNG, electricity, thermal use? And is it used on site or is it sold to the grid or to local facilities? What types of financial assistance did it receive? And then a name of the developer and operator. So all of these information can help educate the industry on successful projects um, and be able to use as a as a guide for new projects. And in the U.S., we really find we really find that value in it, and we hear a lot from project de private developers and the industry that it's one of the most valuable tools that uh, we provide. So some of the next steps in India for this database, um, we're completing a pilot collection data collection efforts and. A few states in India, and we're hopeful that to work with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy to expand it to a national digester database, and ultimately to have this database publicly available and to quantify the methane emission reductions 
from these projects and to help incorporate those methane emission reductions from biogas projects in national uh, greenhouse gas inventories. And so uh, another resource that the Global Methane Initiative is working on right now is really a culmination of all of the work that we've been doing for the last uh, several years. And that is to compile all of our tools and resources that GMI has developed uh, to help assess technical and financial viability of projects into a toolkit. Uh, we've been working, um, we have a number of tools that we've developed over the years, and um, sometimes it can be challenging to know when to use certain tools. And so what we're working on right now is to compile them to help serve as a roadmap for developing, implementing, and quantifying the economic and environmental impacts of biogas projects. And so there's a number of project development steps that are involved with biogas projects. Um, and the graphic there kind of shows a, a sample of some of the, the major steps. And within those steps, we hope to be able to showcase the tools that GMI has helped develop um, over the years so that project developers, project implementers, policymakers, can, that have um, that are interested in building projects and on the policy side that have um, established targets for building biogas projects can help utilize those tools at whatever stage in development that they're at. And so this is uh, just a sample of some of the the tools that we've developed over the years at the various um, steps. And so this will be both for agricultural biogas projects as well as municipal uh, solid waste projects and any organic waste. Uh, can We've developed tools over, over the years to help support that. And so um, it looks like a long list, but we um, right now, and this is only a small part of it, but we'll have some guidance on how to use these tools and at what stage is best to, to use them. So we're really, really excited to uh, make this toolkit available and also to work with other organizations that have similar tools that we um, can add into the toolkit um, and certainly hope to use this to identify additional gaps um, to help support uh, new projects with additional resources and, and tools in the future. And so a few uh, upcoming GMI uh, activities and events that I just wanted to highlight here um, as we're wrapping things up. The, the bio, uh, GMI Annual Biogas Subcommittee meeting will be held this year in Madison, Wisconsin at BioCycle. And BioCycle is, and the subcommittee meeting is a, a gathering of biogas experts to share best practices, discuss challenges, um, and discuss country-specific updates and opportunities um, in the biogas space. And we're really excited to partner with BioCycle. It's uh, the North America's really the best conference for biogas um, uh, here. And there'll also be some site tours. And so we're really excited to have the GMI subcommittee meeting meet there. And we invite you all to attend. And there's more information on the Global Methane Initiatives website on that. Another activity that I wanted to highlight is the Global Methane Challenge. And this is a, an act, a initiative that the Global Methane Initiative launched this past year, really to showcase policies and technologies and all of the, the best ways to reduce methane emissions around the world, really in an effort to help raise awareness and help catalyze uh, new actions to help reduce methane emissions. We've had, I think, over 30 submissions so far from several countries discussing the policies that they've implemented to help reduce methane emissions, as well as a number of submissions from private developers showcasing their technologies and the best practices that they've implemented as well as nonprofit organizations and universities 
that have demonstrated the work that they're doing to help reduce methane emissions. So I really want it to be an opportunity to showcase all of the great work that's happening globally to reduce methane emissions. And it's not just in biogas, um, it also expands the, it crosses the, all of the sectors um, that Global Methane Initiative works on. And in culmination of the Global Methane Challenge, we are hosting a, a, a annual or a semi-annual Global Methane Forum, really as a culmination and a capstone event to showcase the successes of the Global Methane Challenge. We're partnering with the UNECE um, and helping to advocate for the UN to create a year of methane. Um, and so we're ha hosting that meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, the 23rd through the 27th of March. And we invite you all to attend and to create submissions for the Global Methane Challenge so that we can highlight your successes there. So that's uh, the information that I have today. Again, I want to thank you all for, for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions and on or offline today um, and to help work alongside you all to help advance uh, biogas projects and methane emission reductions in the agriculture sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, from the Global Methane Initiative. Uh, thanks for that wealth of information on the different uh, tools you have available to help practitioners assess the environmental, technical, and economic feasibility of, of biogas projects, and as well an overview of, of your upcoming events. Um, now I would like to present the group to our next presenter, uh, Sunil Dingra from Terry. He is the Senior Fellow and Associate Director in Renewable Energy, Techno uh, in Renewable Energy Technology Division of the Energy and Resources Institute based in New Delhi, India. Um, he specializes in the field of renewable energy, bio waste utilization, waste to energy technologies, rural and rural energy aspects. He has 30 years of experience in research, technology development and dissemination, policy and business model development. So I would like to um, welcome you, Sunil, uh, to this webinar. So we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yes, Sunil, we hear you well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Katrina, for uh, uh, kind words and introduction. Uh, so on uh, today uh, webinar, I thought I, uh, 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 I my focus of uh, presentation would be bio waste and cooling application in agriculture and rural communities. Uh, and the focus uh, potential interventions in the state of Punjab and Haryana, where uh, 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 there is uh, a lot of biomass, which is uh, in form of bio waste, both from the agriculture side and agro industrial uh, waste category, which is which is available. And there are growing cooling energy demand, uh, both in agriculture and rural community. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the findings from the research study, which we done, uh, which, it, which we did for Swedish EPA uh, last year, and I'm going to present some of uh, the findings from uh, this particular report, which we have uh, implemented. Some problem with uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so the the main objective of uh, uh, this this report is basically to, to review. Uh, the uh, and map government of India's policies and specific program uh, and schemes on bio waste management 
and also uh, cooling and refrigeration uh, uh, policies in terms of implementing uh, uh, cooling energy in, in agriculture and, and rural communities. Uh, the second broad objective was on review of trends and extent of uh, problem of bio waste management with specific reference to the state of Haryana and Punjab where large amount of uh, uh, area of agriculture is cultivated through paddy crop and uh, paddy waste is uh, uh, the main uh, bio waste which is generated during the process of agriculture uh, cultivation. Uh, the third broad objective uh, of this study was to explore opportunity of alternate technologies and practices to minimize uh, crop residue burning, both from in situ and ex situ uh, measure, which is which is happening uh, in both the states. The fourth uh, objective of uh, our work was on identifying uh, both cooling, cogeneration, and tri generation application in agriculture value chain, where uh, not in kind alternate technology solutions can be potentially applied for. So these were the broad uh, objective of our uh, research work, which we have implemented. Now, when you look into the slide on existing uh, policy and initiative, both at national and sub-government level, uh, these are uh, some of the prominent uh, uh, or important policies are there, which is, uh, and many of them uh, uh, we, we have, uh, Vijay has uh, given from MNRE point of view, and also National Biofuel uh, Policy 2018. The, uh, the one uh, on, on the first bullet, this is uh, National Policy for Management of Crop Residue, uh, which is uh, implemented by Ministry of Agriculture and uh, uh, farm and welfare, uh, uh, government of India, uh, where uh, they are they are promoting in situ application or incorporation of stubble into the farm itself by using uh, uh, farm machinery like uh, uh, happy seeders and some other. Uh, 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 there are eight different types of uh, machines which uh, government of India is promoting through capital subsidy scheme both for individual farmers and also for uh, community uh, hiring center, which has been created in, in both the uh, state to manage uh, crop residue. Uh, then um, I, will, I will skip uh, the MNRE and, and biofuel, which is largely covered. Uh, then uh, Ministry of Power, uh, Government of India is trying to promote co-firing of bio waste in existing thermal power station to reduce the demand of coal uh, by up to 10 percent. So uh, NDPC, which is the largest uh, uh, government of India uh, generating thermal power uh, company, uh, they are now uh, trying to uh, 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 they are trying to co-blend their coal with with uh, biomass in form of either uh, uh, pellets or in form of torrified uh, uh, fuels, uh, which can be uh, created out of uh, agri agriculture residue or, uh, or paddy stock. Uh, uh, then there is very important uh, India Cooling Action Plan was prepared by uh, uh, Ministry of Environment and Forests and Climate Change, uh, which talk about that there are eight time increase in cooling energy demand uh, in next uh, 20 years uh, the country will, will face because of the uh, 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 economical growth which is which is happening uh, so the lifestyle is, is changing of uh, uh, the population and also uh, on account of higher uh, temperature range the uh, which is we are experiencing uh, during uh, summer months, uh, so which requires across uh, different sector like transportation, household, and agriculture, uh, and other sectors, there is an increased demand of cooling energy, uh, which uh, uh, this uh, India Cooling Action Plan is is talking about. Uh, so there is growing uh, demand of cooling energy uh, in, in the country. Uh, then there is uh, important policy on. 
by Ministry of Food Processing Industry, uh, trying to develop a scheme for cold chain in, in India, particularly around uh, uh, cooling energy for agriculture uh, value chain. Uh, so they are, they are promoting uh, 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 through a capital subsidies uh, scheme. Up to 50% of the project cost is, is covered through uh, this program. Uh, uh, to set up uh, infrastructure for uh, cold, storage zone, uh, cold storage chain in, 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 in uh, the country. Uh, then there are uh, the last two bullets are basically specific to uh, uh, state of Punjab and uh, Haryana. They have specific policy uh, 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 to promote uh, biomass or bio-based energy uh, in, in, in that particular state. Uh, and so there are incentive, uh, there are uh, uh, preferential tariff on electricity to produce power from these resource, uh, which can be fed to grid uh, in, in uh, the state of uh, Punjab and Haryana. Uh, so these are some of the important, uh, important uh, uh, policies which are being implemented in, uh, uh, in India both at national and uh, sub-national level. Now, if you look at uh, this slide, why paddy straw, which is, the, uh, which is burned and not being utilized? Uh, there are three broad uh, uh, points here. One, uh, because of mechanized uh, harvesting, which is happening over the years uh, using combined harvest, uh, which actually uh, cut uh, or chop the, the paddy uh, from the top and leave the straw on the field itself. Uh, and this is because uh, the low availability of agriculture manpower, uh, more and more mechanization of farm is happening in both uh, Punjab and Haryana, which led to uh, uh, the use of combined harvest and, and the, the leaving the straw on the field. Uh, the, the second bullet, uh, if you look at the paddy straw being very light, difficult to handle, and expensive to transport. Uh, consequent, uh, consequently, uh, the financial viability uh, is not there uh, for any high value addition, until unless there is a process of uh, a very high value addition of these resource is happening through new technology or new conversion process, uh, then only uh, there will be, uh, uh, farmer will not uh, uh, burn this on, on the field to, to get the value from this resource. Uh, and the third uh, uh, broad uh, uh, challenge is there is a narrow window of uh, harvesting of paddy straw and sowing of the next wheat crop. Uh, so the window is only for uh, two to three weeks uh, and within these uh, three weeks, you have to manage the entire paddy straw, which is uh, uh, which which is cultivated during these 15 days, which is due to about 40 million tons of uh, these resource need to be managed uh, in terms of uh, both the states. Now, if you look at uh, the the graph on on the uh, on on uh, the right hand side, uh, this shows. Uh, 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 the data from satellite, uh, the uh, fire instance, uh, which is occurring in uh, 2016, 17, and 18. Uh, as you can see in Punjab, uh, uh, the, case, the, the cases of fire instance has reduced uh, subsequently in the last two years. Uh, uh, it was very high, uh, close to about uh, 100,000 uh, uh, cases were reported in 2016 which was reduced to half, uh, something around 50,000 cases last year uh, because of the various policies, initiative, uh, and awareness uh, of uh, various programs uh, of uh, pedestroid utilization, both for in situ and ex situ. And same trend has been observed in uh, Haryana, uh, where uh, it was reported 13,000 cases in, uh, in Haryana. Uh, in 2016, which was reduced to something around 6,800 odd last year. But still, uh, the number of cases are very, very high, and the intensity of fire of this farm uh, are, are very high, 
and because of that the air pollution level during winter season uh, in in delhi and uh, neighboring states are very very high uh, which is not healthy for people and also for uh, the economy as a whole so we have to definitely uh, reduce it to uh, or or uh, minimize it to uh, very uh, even uh, lower from these uh, cases so we are going to uh, uh, do uh, the monitoring this year also to understand the impact of uh, various schemes and program during the current uh, uh, year which is uh, the harvesting season will start uh, from uh, next next month or so now if you look at uh, uh, the options for paddy uh, straw utilization as we uh, discussed there is uh, uh, in situ management uh, which is uh, uh, for as a manual for soil uh, enrichment and for nutrient back to the soil uh, so this is uh, the program which is which is happening and the ex situ options are power generation you pr produce briquettes and torrified fuels uh, from this resource uh, there are uh, 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 pilot projects which produce uh, biogas and bio cng from paddy straw or mix of paddy straw and cow dung uh, as as a feedstock uh, there are a uh, few uh, pilot uh, uh, demonstration pro uh, uh, projects uh, both in haryana and punjab which will produce bioethanol from from uh, lignocellulose material largely uh, paddy straw and a uh, some amount of uh, paddy straw is used as pulp and paper uh, and and board uh, and eco panel uh, so basically material recovery uh, application of uh, paddy straw which is ha also happening in in some form uh, in both the states so these are uh, various uh, types of options which exist uh, as of now for utilization of paddy straw now if you look at uh, this slide which uh, uh, look at the opportunities of cold chain uh, and uh, if you see the total uh, production in million tons of various type of fruits vegetables flower uh, aromatics and medicinal plant uh, spices milk uh, something around 491 million tons of uh, these produce are are uh, Uh, produce annually in in the country and if you look at uh, the cold storage facility required uh, for uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, material or or produce to store uh, uh, then close to about 359 million tons of this total of 491 uh, million tons would required cold storage facility if you have to Uh, uh keep that for a longer uh, time frame uh and the shelf life has to be uh, sustained uh, uh so uh, the huge requirement of cold storage and the existing cold storage which is available in the country uh, as per the 2018 data is close to uh, only 39 uh, million ton uh, storage capacity uh, so, which is only 10% of the total potential which is there in the country so 90% cold storage facility to store these uh, perishable products uh, which are produced uh, in the country uh, need uh, infrastructure on on ground uh, at the farm farm level or at the agriculture level so there is a need to develop sustainable cold cold chain development in the country Uh, to create more value for farmers uh, for these produce uh, at the local level uh, now if you look at uh, uh, we we last two year we start uh, discussing with farmer uh, to uh, whether they can shift to some alternate crops in in uh, uh, where they are growing uh, mostly paddy and and wheat uh, so the perspective from uh, farmers are Uh, if they go to say for example horticulture crops uh, then uh, the challenge with them is if the truck doesn't come on on that particular day uh, is half of uh, spinach will will rot uh, because of non availability of cold storage at his farm level uh, the infrastructure of storage is not there 
and in some cases the farmer uh, 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 told us that the mandi the, the market of these produce uh, they open only once a week uh, and uh, so uh, uh, so he will lose half of his fruits and and other uh, produce uh, uh, because is the market is not open on a daily basis uh, so these are some of the constraint farmer uh, uh, is facing uh, and uh, uh, like for example in, in the case 3 uh, the capsaicin price as the farmer perceive will increase after 4 days uh, so that is the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the situation but he cannot hold it fresh uh, till uh, 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 that time so uh, and facility of storage is not there so these are some of the challenge which which uh, Uh, which is there uh, and which can be very effectively uh, 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 effectively uh, 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 control both the bio bio waste management and meeting the cooling energy demand of the farmer community. That is what we are bringing out from the, this report for both the policy maker at uh, national level and sub national level. Uh, and as you can see that india is the second largest uh, producer of fruit and vegetables and largest producer of milk in the in the world uh, so this is very important for rural economy to grow uh, uh, in years to come uh, uh, so growing need of cooling energy in rural area uh, both for agriculture value chain development is very very essential uh, in in coming years okay so this is uh, uh, the slide i am uh, sharing with uh, uh, what is the typical demand of cooling energy for milk collection and processing so we did this uh, uh, research in in a district in punjab which is sangrur uh, where there are uh, five uh, 71 villages in this particular district and each village has a surplus milk production of about 800 to 1000 liter uh, milk is collected and stored in in a uh, bulk milk chiller uh, and typically they have to store it uh, almost about a, a day uh, of 24 hours so they have to maintain uh, 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 the uh, the temperature range from 4 to 5 degree uh, uh, in this bulk, uh, uh, bulk milk chiller so there is external energy and cooling energy which is uh, typically coming from grid or from diesel for uh, in most of the cases where uh, grid is not reliable uh, so this is what uh, happening in all the villages uh, uh, in 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 in, in uh, the district and once uh, 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 then the further accumulation of uh, this uh, milk is happening at a cluster of villages so from every 20 to 25 villages uh, there is one milk collection center is there from where this uh, milk is been collected and stored uh, in uh, something around 15000 to uh, 20000 liter of milk is is stored in in this uh, milk collection center and then finally this milk is is uh, taken to milk processing units uh, which is uh, uh, which is have uh, 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 which is which is there in in this particular uh, district so this is the milk collection and supply chain arrangement where at each level at the village level or or milk collection center there is a demand of cooling energy which need to be fulfilled uh, for uh, uh, storing the milk in 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 in, in those location so there is clear need for supply sustainable cooling solution uh for milk collection and storage uh, application in in this uh, district uh now i think uh, biogas a uh, base cooling decentralized cooling system has a great potential in in uh, uh, uh in the country uh, uh like for example now there is advancement in uh, biogas technology these are the picture you i am just taking the membrane based biogas digester 
so you can either at the farm level uh, wherever the waste is is uh, generated you uh, uh, you uh, produce this biogas and store in this membrane based biogas digester or you can transport this uh, uh, biogas uh, digester uh, the flexible uh, system to uh, wherever you want to use as, as a chilling application or for uh, a cold storage application uh, so these are some of the opportunity and uh, uh, you and the typically uh, for 55 cubic meter of biogas is required on a daily basis to run a chiller which can store 15 to 13 tons of uh, cold storage uh, uh, facility or uh, 15000 liter of uh, 1500 liter of diesel or liter of milk uh, in a in a chilling unit and typically uh, uh, this flexible base uh, biogas unit will will uh, there is an investment of about 10000 uh, uh, dollar for producing 160 cubic meter of digester and 55 cubic meter of biogas which is sufficient to run this facility at a decentralized scale. So this can give a good opportunity for farmer to shift to horticulture crop or for storage of milk in at the village at the farm level. Uh, and, and biogas uh, which can be produced from both animal waste which, uh, which is available at village level or from paddy straw or the agriculture waste which uh, which is uh, to be managed uh, through different program. So this is one of uh, the, the, the case study uh, from a cooling energy from a food storage facility. Again, uh, a location in Kapoorthala, one of the district in Punjab, where 15 met a metric ton of storage of uh, 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 fruits uh, are, are, are being kept and mainly, mainly for uh, pre-cooling and, and, and uh, basically for pears and melon, which is grown in uh, the local community. And farmer get 35% higher price uh, when they store in, in uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the cooling uh, 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 facility. Uh, whenever there is a higher price, he is offletting this uh, uh, selling is produced uh, at higher price. Otherwise, farmer distress sale is happening uh, whenever uh, facilities is not there. Uh, these kind of a cold, cold storage facility is not there. On the operational cost side, uh, 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 to run this uh, biogas based uh, cold storage, something around 220 uh, rupees, Indian rupees, which is typically about uh, uh, three to four dollar. Uh, per day he has to spend on managing this cold storage uh, and equally he is saving about 100 unit of electricity if it is uh, run through uh, grid for example uh, and many cases it is uh, run through diesel where a grid is not reliable then his cost is about 800 which is four times uh, if it is depending upon grid electricity and almost about 10 times uh, he has to spend on fuel if he's using diesel as a resource. Uh, so a biogas base is not only uh, environment friendly, uh, but also uh, it is saving money to, uh, 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 to, to operate and run this kind of a facility, uh, uh, which can run on uh, both on biomass gasification or on uh, biogas based system. So this is a typical case study uh, from uh, Punjab uh, and more and more such systems are now being planned in, in uh, uh, both states of Punjab and Haryana. Uh, this is uh, a slide which, which summarizes the potential of biogas uh, both for cooling in a circular economy. Uh, so uh, the farm which, which uh, use sunlight through photosynthetic process. Uh, so uh, you have agriculture and other forms of uh, uh, plantation, which is which is grown, uh, taking a moisture from the atmosphere and also CO2. And finally, this plant emits CO2, uh, which is uh, 
to the atmosphere and the food which is uh, uh, the raw food and also the stubble and the waste uh, from the plant can go to uh, 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 to feed a biogas plant and you have this cooling energy which uh, or a cold storage which can run on this biogas and store this uh, the food itself uh, in, in using this green chili uh, so that you improve livelihoods uh, and reduce uh, food spoilage and less stress on our environment uh, because uh, there is no uh, global warming impact of uh, these kind of a uh, system because these are uh, based on ammonia uh, cycle so there is no HFC and CFC used in this uh, uh, cooling system. So entirely uh, environment friendly uh, uh, chilling units are there. So eventually, so like, uh, uh, apologies to interrupt. Uh, we are running out of time, and if I could kindly ask you to uh, start wrapping up your presentation, so we can allow yes. for the last presenter. Thank sure, you very sure. much. So this is uh, uh, typically my last slide. So eventually, uh, one would uh, reduce. Uh, uh, the water consumption uh, because of the spoilage of uh, the, the food and also the mineral which is uh, uh, go back to the soil uh, in terms of uh, for nutrients and other application which is coming out of the biogas plant in form of manure. So it's a good model of uh, uh, food and, uh, and, and uh, uh, biogas application in a circular economy which need to be promoted uh, in, 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 in countries like India uh, in a big way. So this report finding uh, got a lot of attraction from uh, print media. So these are some of uh, uh, the recent uh, 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 articles which has been uh, published in, in uh, both in the local newspaper and also in national print media which has been uh, covered through this uh, uh, report. So, there a lot of uh, uh, awareness has been created out of this, this work. So, this is my, my last slide uh, and thank you very much uh, giving me the opportunity for uh, sharing this uh, report to you. Over to uh, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Um, it, it was very interesting to hear about bio waste and, and cooling energy in agriculture in, in uh, the rural areas of India. Um, I would like, apologies as we are running out of time, I would like to move on to Chris Vol's presentation. He is head of the Waste, Recycling and Biogas um, Advisory Section of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark, Trade Council of North America. Uh, Chris has been a champion for renewable energy, improved waste management and methane capture for more than 30 years uh, and is currently working to bring Danish innovation to help grow the North American biogas market. Um, before that, Chris headed the US EPA AgStar program and acted as co-chair of the Global Methane Initiative Biogas Subcommittee. So welcome, Chris. Thank you Thanks, for- Thanks, Catalina. Uh, just confirm you can hear me okay, Catalina? Yes, I can hear you and uh, please prompt Great. me to change the slide when, when ready. Well, let's go ahead, Catalina, let's go ahead and get to the next slide. I'm gonna move quickly as I know we're short on time and just give you a, a brief overview. Um, as Catalina said, I, I work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark and uh, actually work as part of an energy and environment team um, uh, looking at opportunities in the areas that you see in the red boxes um, uh, across North America. Uh, as I think most of you probably know, Denmark is one of the world leaders in wind but also has a lot of competency in water and wastewater technologies, bio, obviously biogas, which I'll be talking about, uh, district energy, uh, heating and cooling, which may be applicable uh, per, per the last presenter, uh, and then energy efficiency. Uh, next slide, uh, Catalina. So the, the state of biogas production in Denmark, um, uh, up until 2012, as you could see from the slide, uh, most of the biogas production uh, in the country was on kind of uh, single biogas plants on an individual farm. Um, and what I'll, what I'll talk about briefly in the next uh, few minutes here is 
why we why Denmark has seen a you know, four uh, four time increase in biogas production since 2012. As you can see, some of the statistics here um, about 11 percent. And this says biogas. It probably should say biomethane. Um, 11 percent of the natural gas grid in Denmark last year was biomethane or renewable natural gas. As you can see, at one point it went up to 18 percent. Uh, of the total, and with all the the positive impact or positive movement forward, uh, still only about 12% of the manure is in biogas production. The rest is placed directly on uh, directly on fields as fertilizer. Uh, a couple of important points to make here: um, about 40% of the energy in Denmark currently comes from wind power. About 90% of the municipal solid waste is actually handled in, in waste to energy facilities with di district heating and cooling uh, as the energy source uh, from that. But Denmark recognized that there's a need for non-electric uh, renewable energy, and that's why biogas was focused on. Uh, next slide, Catalina. So I'm not going to have time to spend um, a lot on this particular slide, but these are some of the reasons the transformation of the biogas sector in Denmark has occurred. And this has been a priority since the mid-1980s. Um, uh, Denmark wanted to become more energy independent, reduce its uh, need for imported fuels. Very important is the agricultural waste management uh, sector in the country. Uh, there's about 5.7 million people in Denmark, uh, but there's about 1.5 million dairy cows, 12.5 million pigs, and about 60% of Denmark's total area is is under ag, um, uh, is cultivated for aggregation. So it's very important from a, um, a GDP standpoint or an economic standpoint but also um, protecting the soil and water are critical. Um, you know, how did we get there? I'm not gonna really have time to go into all of these things, but uh, in that transformation from single on-farm biogas plants to centralized system, there was obviously an incredible professionaliz professionalization of the industry. There was the ability to use the natural gas grid energy infrastructure that was already in place in the country. There was a high value uh, subsidy placed on the production of renewable natural gas. Across the European Union, there was also uh, a monetary uh, credit um, uh, applied to, to that. A lot of collaboration and um, not, not last, but uh, uh, not last was having farmer buy-in and having a focus on uh, increasing farmer uh, revenue. Next slide, Catalina. So, again, the, the kind of after uh, 2012, when the federal subsidy was put in, really a new Danish biogas model was formed. You can see it both here visually, but also just very briefly, uh, the move was to large scale centralized co digestion plants. Um, and there's, there's about three dozen of those. Uh, that have grown in the last five years or so. Um, uh, again, the discussion about uh, managing straw and uh, um, is interesting because a lot of straw from uh, animal bedding as well as other sources go into the plants in Denmark. Um, the products from most of the facilities are renewable natural gas or biomethane, organic fertilizer, uh, animal bedding, and uh, in, in one instance, food grade carbon dioxide. Uh, the farmer cooperative model is one that has a long history in Denmark, and this has been applied in the biogas space as well, uh, where groups of 50 to 150 farmers uh, form a cooperative and um, deliver their manure and slurry to the biogas plants and receive organic fertilizer back. Um, and that has been a, um, a critical component in making these projects successful. Next slide, Catalina. So here's a, 
here's a picture uh, of one of those large scale centralized uh, facilities. Again, uh, not a lot of time to go into detail, uh, but just to give you a sense of scale, uh, that plant uh, in, the, in the photo takes in about 1 million tons per year of biomass. About half of it is, a uh, half to 60% is, is manure. Uh, the other is made up of some of those other feedstocks we talked about, uh, food waste, food residuals, uh, agricultural residuals. Um, again, all of the large-scale plants produce renewable natural gas. The truck that you see in the upper right-hand corner uh, is actually uh, what is used primarily for uh, the farmers do not bring their manure themselves to the plants. The digester system operators use those vehicles to go and pick up the manure, bring it into the facility, and then take the digested uh, um, uh, biomass back to the farm uh, to be used as fertilizer. So <clears throat> very little odor, very little spillage of manure on the roads. Next slide, please. Another uh, real component um, that has made the system successful in Denmark is treating food waste uh, and uh, food production waste. Um, the plant that is in the, the bottom left, with ha which has the green stack, that's a food waste pretreatment uh, plant um, where they take in source separated organics from households and off spec commercial products, which oftentimes could come in in a pelletized form, as you see in the middle right-hand picture, or the pile that's in the upper right is more of what the citizens would put out at the, at the curb. All of that is taken into the facility and you produce the biopulp, which you see in the bottom right-hand uh, picture, and that's 99.9% .9 organic content, <clears throat> which is then delivered primarily to those on-farm co-digestion systems. Uh, next slide. Again, because uh, RNG production and biomethane production have been the financial driver, there is lots of uh, experience in Denmark on different technologies for biogas upgrading. Uh, they primarily use amine scrubbing and water wash systems in Denmark um, and have um, a lot of, uh, again, a lot of uh, technological experience um, uh, with, those, with those systems. Next slide. An emerging area, which I will spend only a short amount of time, is the concept of power to gas, which uh, many of you may have heard. Uh, this is a process to use, um, uh, I'll call it excess renewable energy from wind or solar uh, to be able to uh, drive a, a, uh, a chemical process, which allows us to use biogas um, and uh, create renewable natural gas for um, injection into the grid. So you could, you could view the, the natural gas grid as a giant battery um, because as we are storing renewable natural gas, we can pull it out later for electric generation, for fuel, uh, for feedstock, for, for various uh, processes. Um, and there's a project, there's a currently a feasibility study going on in Denmark at a dairy farm where they have a digester and um, an upgrade a biogas upgrade system, uh, as well as six wind turbines. And so they're currently assessing the, the feasibility of, of having a power to gas system at this, uh, at this dairy farm. Next slide, uh, Catalina. Very quickly, uh, one of the programs that I'm involved in, in um, uh, uh, it's called Biogas Go Global. Uh, this is a partnership program that's funded by uh, an organization in Denmark. Um, the initial focus is to try to grow the biogas sector in the United States, but we're also looking for uh, partners uh, over the, over the uh, second half of the project. And in fact, my colleagues at the, uh, a group called the Agribusiness Park in Denmark have already begun collaborations in India. So it'll be interesting to do some follow-up uh, between myself and, and some of the other presenters here to see how we might uh, collaborate on some, some efforts um, in India. And as you can see, this is a program uh, that looks to form partnerships across academia and research, uh, government to government cooperation, 
as well as commercial export and, and industry focus. Catalina, last slide. So I apologize, I went through that very quickly, but uh, hopefully at least you got a flavor of um, um, the some of the drivers that have helped push Denmark forward. And uh, um, again, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after the fact. And uh, thanks, thanks again, Catalina and James, for for having me on today. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you to all of the presenters on today's webinar for your uh, very useful and interesting presentations. We regret uh, the time constraints, and uh, but we would like to invite all of the participants to send through your questions or comments uh, to my email that I will send through the chat box right now and we can get back to you individually. We will, we will also be happy to um, share all of these great presentations that contain the presenter's contact details um, so you can get in touch directly. Uh, so thank you very much to all. Have a good day and um, Please, once again, please send through your comments to my email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Katina, just one. Uh, is it possible for you to send across uh, the presentations? Yes, yes, of course, uh, Rakesh. I will be sending um, the presentations to the entire group yeah, via CCAC teamwork and um, to others who have submitted their email through the chat. So we'll do. Thank you, Thank you for joining. Thank you.